Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and my co-host is Katie. You can tell us apart because my hair is purple and Katie's is red. Yeah, Ellen, that's that's how you tell us apart. Uh-huh. Yeah. Let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 11, the Sorting Hat's new song, and the somewhat corresponding film scenes. Harry is getting real tired of everyone's bullshit. Seamus makes the mistake of trying to slam fabric and ends up looking like an even bigger tool than before. Neville proves once again why he belongs in Gryffindor. Ron and Dean get stuck in between their best friends. And classes haven't even started and everyone already wants the new defense teacher to fuck back off on the broom she rode in on. During episode 137, Aggressive Dressing, our Potter pondering was, how do you think they came up with the passwords for the Gryffindor Tower and what would you make it if you could? Hey Ellen, hey Katie, Jackson here with this week's Potter Pondering. How do I think that the passwords for Gryffindor Tower are chosen? Honestly, I think they're just random. You know, the fat lady thinks up a new one every couple of months, unlike Circa Doggin with his crazy passwords every couple of days. (laughs) And, you know, she only really puts thought into them when it's an occasion, like at Christmas with the password fairy lights. Yeah, that's my thoughts. And what would be my choice of a Gryffindor password? Well, Gryffindors are known for their bravery, so I'd pick something that relates to bravery, like Carpe Diem, you know, seize the day, something like that. That's my pondering. Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. How do they come up with the passwords for the Gryffindor Tower? And what would the password be if I could choose? And... I would like to think that the portraits convened and discussed password choices throughout the year for all types of things, you know, anything that you could possibly need a password for and maybe a list, a little vote, you know, maybe, possibly, it's just me thinking, but the real answer is probably just fucking magic. And if I could pick, I have no idea. Maybe something confusing that everybody would fuck up, but if I was the fat lady, I'd let everybody in anyway as long as they tried and it was pretty close. Maybe Pip and Pep Salopacopolis? And that way I could sit my fat ass in that portrait and just laugh at everybody fucking it up and I'd let them in anyway. Yeah, I'd be a horrible fat lady. Hey guys, Mike calling in for the Potter Pondering about who chooses the passwords. Initially, I was going to say maybe it's like Dumbledore or somebody, but then I remember back in, I think in second year, the password for the Slytherin common room was pure blood, and that just seems a bit controversial for Dumbledore to have chosen. So I'm thinking it's probably like a prefect, like maybe the prefects get together and decide on what it is. And for this year, when it's maybe just Nimbletonia, I could definitely see it being like Hermione being like, oh, we need something that Neville can remember. So I think that's my thoughts on that. Thanks. Bye. Hi, this is Kendra. I am calling in my Potter pondering. The question was, how do I think that they come up with a password for the Gryffindor Tower? And I've always had the idea that it was just the fat lady, the portrait that came up with them. The only thing is this most recent, you know, episode where we're covering that it was Mimbleus Mimbletonia. That's just too suspicious to be like, like, how would she know? So I don't know, maybe the heads of, well, at least McGonagall, maybe she has some say in it, but it just seems like, you know, when Sir, oh my gosh, I wanted to call him Sir Cardigan. Um, Anyways, when he was doing it, he was changing the passwords all the time, so he had to be coming up with them himself. There's no way McG was coming up with all those, so I still think the portraits have the overall say in it. That's what I think. But the question on what password I choose, I don't know, I'm just thinking of like having to sit there all day long and constantly open and close that portrait, and I just think my password would be, leave me the hell alone. All right, bye-bye. 
Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, who has made Gryffindor Quidditch captain in Harry's fifth year at Hogwarts? Angelina Johnson is made the Gryffindor Quidditch captain. Congratulations goes to Megan Slater. Woohoo! This is her second week in a row. It's officially a streak. Will she keep it going? We shall see. For now, let's just keep rolling into the first half of Chapter 12, Professor Umbridge, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Chapter 12, Professor Umbridge, Part 1. Seamus rushes out of the dormitory the next morning, leaving Harry to wonder aloud if he thinks he'll turn into a nutter if he stays in the room with him too long. Dean tries to console Harry but can't find the words and just pauses awkwardly before walking out of the room himself. Both Neville and Ron give Harry it's his problem not yours looks, but Harry still doesn't feel better, prompting Hermione to ask him what's wrong when she catches up with them in the common room. Before Harry can answer, she's distracted by a notice on the board, advertising for virtually painless paid positions under Fred and George. Hermione insists to Ron that they will have to talk to them, though he clearly does not want to have to do that. As they make their way to the Great Hall, she turns the conversation back to Harry, again asking him what's up, and Ron speaks up for him, explaining that Seamus thinks he's lying about you-know-who. Hermione sighs and shares that Lavender does too, which causes Harry to loudly question if she's been having a nice little chat with her about whether or not he's a lying, attention-seeking prat. Hermione calmly informs him that she told Lavender to keep her big fat mouth shut and also reminds him that they are on his side, so it would be really nice if he would stop jumping down their throats. Harry apologizes and Hermione accepts, then shakes her head and reminds the boys what Dumbledore said at the end of term feast the previous year about you-know-who's gift for spreading discord and enmity. Once they get over the initial amazement that Hermione remembers things like that, she also explains that it's exactly what the Sorting Hat was warning them about, too. You-know-who has only been back two months and they're already fighting amongst themselves. Ron brings up Harry's comment from the night before about how it's a fat chance they're going to get matey with the Slytherins, but Hermione retorts that it's a pity they aren't trying for a little bit of inner house unity. They reach the bottom of the marble staircase and encounter a line of Ravenclaw fourth years who see Harry and huddle together to form a tighter group. Harry sarcastically mentions how they really ought to be trying to make friends with people like that. They make their way into the Great Hall where the rain cloud gray enchanted ceiling reflects Harry's mood. He again comments on Hagrid's absence and his concern that Dumbledore never mentioned how long Grubbly Plank would be staying. Hermione thinks that maybe he didn't want to draw attention to Hagrid being gone, but before they can discuss this any further, Angelina Johnson shows up to let Harry know she's been made Gryffindor Quidditch captain, and tryouts for a new keeper will take place Friday at 5 o'clock. She says she wants the whole team there so she can see how the new person will fit in, and Harry agrees. When she walks away, Hermione vaguely wonders how much of a difference Wood being gone will make for the team, and Ron comments that it won't hurt to have some new blood. They are again interrupted, this time by the arrival of owls swooping in to deliver letters and packages. A large barn owl swoops towards Hermione, bearing a copy of the Daily Prophet, and prompting Harry to irritably wonder why she's still bothering to get it. She explains that she thinks it's best to know what the enemy are saying, and disappears behind it for the rest of breakfast. When finished, she rolls it up and informs Harry that there's nothing in it about him or Dumbledore. McGonagall is now handing out the schedules, and Ron is not happy with their schedule for that day, because they have History of Magic, Double Potions, Divination, and Double Defense Against the Dark Arts. He mentions hoping Fred and George get their skiving snack boxes sorted, and his brothers overhear him and pretend to be shocked that a prefect wants to skive off lessons. Ron shows them his schedule in response, and Fred offers him a bit of nosebleed nougat for cheap, since they don't yet have the antidote to stop the bleeding. Ron passes, but Hermione takes this opportunity to tell the twins that they can't advertise for testers on the Gryffindor notice board. They playfully argue with her about it, telling her that she'll feel differently when the year gets going since it's her OWL year, and the exams cause about half the fifth years to have nervous breakdowns. 
George calls it a nightmare of a year, especially if you care about exam results, mentioning that he and Fred still manage to keep their spirits up. Ron points out that they only got three OWLs each, but the twins aren't the least bit concerned and say that they almost didn't even bother returning to school for their seventh year. George nearly lets it slip that they have the gold from Harry, but instead suggests that they don't really need any WTs. They ultimately decided not to leave school early, though, because they weren't sure their mom could take it, on top of Percy being such a prat. Instead, they are going to use their last year to do some market research for their joke shop. Hermione wonders where they're going to get the gold to start it all up, and Harry deliberately drops his fork to dive out of sight and retrieve it. He hears Fred tell Hermione to ask them no questions and they'll tell her no lies, and then the twins head off to get to class early to try to sell some extendable ears. Hermione asks if they meant they already got some gold, and Ron mentions how they bought him new dress robes. Harry decides he better change the subject and asks if they are right about fifth year being really tough. Ron is sure it will be because OWLs can affect the jobs you can later get, and Bill told him that they will also get career advice. As they head to their first class, they begin discussing what they might want to do after Hogwarts, and both Harry and Ron want to be Aurors. Hermione isn't sure exactly, just knows she wants to do something worthwhile, like possibly take SPEW further. History of magic is commonly regarded as the most boring subject. It is taught by their only ghost teacher, who has a wheezy, droning voice that causes severe drowsiness within 10 minutes, 5 if the weather is warm. He never varies the form of the lessons, just lectures without pausing as the students take notes or stare sleepily into space. Harry and Ron always manage to get passing grades by copying Hermione's notes before exams. This day's lesson is about giant wars and could be mildly interesting if taught by a different teacher, but after 10 minutes, Harry's brain disengages and he and Ron spend the rest of class playing hangman on a corner of parchment. Hermione gives them dirty looks out of the corner of her eye, and as they leave the room, threatens to not share her notes with them this year. Ron tells her that they'd failed their OWLs and asks if she wants that on her conscience. She says they deserve it and asks if they even try to listen to him. Ron insists that they do and flatters her by saying that they just don't have her brains or concentration, calling her cleverer than they are. She calls that rubbish, but looks slightly mollified as they make their way into the courtyard. It's drizzling a little, so they huddle under a secluded corner and turn their collars up against the chilly September as they talk about what difficult task they think Snape is going to have them do for his first lesson. As they talk, Cho Chang shows up to say hi to Harry for a second time in so many days. Harry is relieved that he isn't covered in stink sap this time, and thinking along the same lines, she mentioned how he got that stuff off himself. Harry tries to grin like it's a funny memory, and awkwardly asks her how her summer was, before remembering that, as Cedric's girlfriend, his death likely affected her holiday almost as badly as it affected Harry's. Her face tautens, but she says it was alright, before Ron interrupts to ask about the tornado's badge she's wearing wondering if she supports them. She says she does, and Ron wants to know if she always has, or if it's just started since they began winning the league. Cho coolly insists that she has supported them since she was six, and says bye to Harry before walking away. Once out of earshot, Hermione rounds on Ron and scolds him for attacking her about her Quidditch team when she clearly wanted to talk to Harry alone. The two begin bickering about it, and continue even after Harry points out that the bell rang and that they need to head to potions. They continue arguing as they walk to class, giving Harry plenty of time to reflect on whether or not he'd ever actually get to have a conversation with Cho that he could look back on without wanting to leave the country. But he's also pleased that she's choosing to talk to him, and even entering Snape's dungeon doesn't burst that hopeful bubble. They make their way to their usual table in the back, and the entire class falls silent as Snape closes the door and tells them to settle down. He begins class by reminding them about their important exams in June, and telling them that, though moronic some of the class may be, he expects them to at least get an acceptable or suffer his displeasure. His gaze lingers on Neville, who gulps, 
Then Snape continues speaking, informing them that after this year, many will cease studying with him because he only takes the very best into his NEWT potions class. So some of them will certainly be saying goodbye. This time his eyes rest on Harry, and Harry glares back, feeling grim pleasure at the idea of giving up potions class. Snape again resumes speaking, saying they have another year before that happy moment of farewell, and advising them to concentrate on maintaining the high pass level he expects, whether they plan to continue with potions or not. He informs them that they will making a common ordinary wizarding level potion, known as the Draft of Peace, which calms anxiety and soothes agitation, though being too heavy-handed with the ingredients can put the drinker into a heavy and sometimes irreversible sleep. So they must pay close attention. Hermione sits up straighter as Snape flicks his wand, and the ingredients and directions magically appear on the blackboard. He tells them that the ingredients are in the store cupboard and they have an hour and a half. Just as the trio predicted, Snape could have hardly set them a more difficult potion to brew. Everything has to be added in just the right amounts in order, stirred precisely in very specific directions, and simmered at the proper temperature for an exact amount of time before the final ingredient is added. With 10 minutes left to class, Snape informs them that a light silver vapor should be rising from the potion, and Harry looks up from his own cauldron, which is issuing copious amounts of dark gray steam, to see that Ron's is emitting green sparks, and the fire on Seamus's has gone out. Hermione's is perfect, but Snape sweeps by without making any comment and moves on to give Harry a hard time about not adding two drops of hellbore syrup before proceeding to the next step. He calls it useless and vanishes Harry's entire potion before telling the rest of the class to fill a flagon with a sample to turn in to be tested. He also assigns 12 inches of parchment on the properties of Moonstone and its uses in potion making to be turned in on Thursday. As everyone fills their flagons, Harry clears away his things, seething, because his potion was no worse than Ron's or Neville's, but he was the only one who would be getting zero marks. When the bell rings, he's the first one out of the dungeon and has already started eating lunch by the time Ron and Hermione catch up with him. Hermione tells him that Snape was being really unfair since his potion was nowhere near as bad as Goyle's, but Harry just glowers and asks when Snape has ever been fair to him. Neither have an answer for him, but Hermione does say that she thought he might be a bit better this year since he's in the order. But Ron points out that poisonous toadstools don't change their spots, saying that he has always thought Dumbledore is a bit cracked for trusting Snape. As the two begin bickering again, Harry tells them to shut up because their fighting is starting to drive him mad. He gets up and leaves the Great Hall, making his way up the marble staircase two steps at a time, and spends the rest of his lunch sitting alone under the trap door at the top of the North Tower. When the bell rings, he's the first one to ascend the ladder into Professor Trelawney's class, and she's so preoccupied with battered copies of leather-bound books that she doesn't even notice him. Over the next five minutes, the rest of the class arrives, and when Ron shows up, he makes his way right to Harry and informs him that he and Hermione have stopped arguing, but that Hermione says it would be nice if he'd stop taking his temper out on them because it isn't their fault how Snape and Seamus treat him. Before Harry can respond, Trelawney starts class by welcoming them back and telling them that they will find copies of the Dream Oracle by Inigo Imago and shares that dream interpretation is an important means of divining the future and likely to be tested in their OWL. She goes on to say that she doesn't believe that examination passes or failures are remotely important when it comes to the sacred art of divination, but the headmaster likes them to sit the exam. She directs them to turn to the introduction to read and then partner up with someone to interpret each other's recent dreams. Since it isn't a double lesson, by the time they finish reading, they only have about 10 minutes to discuss their dreams. As Neville gives Dean a long-winded explanation about his nightmare involving a pair of giant scissors wearing his grandmother's hat, Ron looks at Harry and tells him to share one since he never remembers his dreams. Harry has no desire to share his nightmares about the graveyard with anyone and insists that Ron must remember something. When Ron mentions having one about playing Quidditch, 
Harry reckons it probably means he's going to be eaten by a giant marshmallow or something. He flips through the book without interest and isn't remotely cheered when Trelawney sets them to keep a dream diary for the next month as homework. Obviously, we don't have any film scenes for this half of the chapter. Thank God, because it would have been even longer. (laughs) Right? (laughs) So that just leaves us to talk about everything that we didn't get to see. Yeah, if we did have film scenes that went along with this half too, it probably would have been a three-part episode. Oh, at the least. The book chapter was 27 pages long. It's a long-ass chapter. It took me so long to do that summary. Sorry, Ellen. (laughs) I can kind of understand why this wasn't included. Mm -hmm. It was about 14 pages of fluff. Which sometimes you need. And I don't know if we needed it per se. Maybe not in the movie. I think that the movie could have benefited from it. At least something. Considering how much they like montaging things, they could have done like a little montage of Harry's worst moments in his other classes. True. I can't tell you the number of times that on one of those Harry Potter fan pages, we'll see people comment about how those that like Snape are clearly basing it off of Alan Rickman in the movies and must not have read the books. Yeah. Which... Kind of fair. Kind of fair, because the movies don't show kind of how much of a dick Snape really is. He's just a lot more of a dick than the movie paints him to be. Right. But in the book, it starts off picking up from the next morning after they've gone to bed with this argument with Seamus. Mm -hmm. And Seamus just dresses top speed and rushes out of the dormitory. And Harry basically yells after him, like, what? Does he think staying here is going to turn him into a nutter like me? (laughs) I think he was just looking to fucking avoid that topic of conversation. I'm pretty sure that's why Harry yelled after him so he couldn't fully avoid it. And Dean even hesitates to try and console Harry a little bit, saying, he's just, uh, bye. Yeah. (laughs) He doesn't know what he just is. Yeah. He's he's... just something. He's just, uh, what was that? I'm coming. I'll be right there, Seamus. Oh, my phone's but, ringing. Yeah. <laughs> it's the 90s. Nobody has phones. Uh, it's still ringing. It's the one at home. I can hear it from I here. I can hear it. It's magic. Yeah. <laughs> and then you've got Neville and Ron who are just giving Harry this, it's his problem, not yours look. And Harry mm-hmm. is not comforted by this. Harry's just sitting there thinking, he's making it my problem, though. It might not supposed to be my problem. But I have to deal with this shit. Right? He brought me into this. Right? Poor Harry. I can understand why he's kind of angry. He's got a lot to be upset about. It's been a rough few months. Mm -hmm. For sure. Maybe even really a rough few years. Maybe. Or, you know, a rough life. I might go that far. Sure. It's not really getting better. Boy's been dealt a hand. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway... Hermione wants to know what's wrong, and before he has a chance to answer her, they get distracted by a notice, an advertisement, if you will, hanging Hmm. on the Gryffindor common room board, made by Fred and George Weasley, advertising virtually painless jobs, paid positions, basically they need testers for their products. Never trust the phrase virtually painless. Yeah, that means that it could feasibly be at least a little painful. Yeah. And since it's being posted by Fred and George, those odds go way up. Oh, yeah. (laughs) She tells Ron that they're going to have to talk to them about this. And Ron's like, why? I don't want to do that. Why do we have to do that? (laughs) Hermione tells him we can't let them test their products on kids. Like, we're prefix. We have to do something about this. Do we, though? That's exactly where Ron is. Exactly. But as they're making their way to the Great Hall, she just turns back to Harry again, asking him what's going on. And he still doesn't want to say anything. He's super pissed. Rightfully so, I think. As he has a right to be, yes. So it's Ron who speaks up and tells Hermione that Seamus thinks he's lying about you-know-who. And Harry expects Hermione to be upset on his behalf, but she just sighs. She's just sighing. Lavender thinks so, too. And Harry gets super fiery and Mm -hmm. says, oh, are you just having a nice little chat with Lavender about what a lying attention-seeking prat I am? 
I mean, they live together, guy. What do you expect? Probably a little bit of defense from Hermione, I'm imagining. Well, yeah, but I'm sure she did. Which she did. She's, exactly. Like, by the way, she informs him that she told Lavender to keep her big fat mouth shut. Mmm, bitch. And then also mentions that it'd be really nice if he'd stop jumping down their throats because in case he hasn't noticed, they're on his side. Mm Mm-hmm. And this actually does make Harry feel bad. And he's like, sorry. (laughs) You always hurt the ones you love. She's the bigger person. She says, it's okay. I accept your apology. (laughs) But then shakes her head and reminds them what Dumbledore said at the end of term feast last year and basically quotes it word for word and the boys are like how do you remember all this hermione's just like i remember everything she's like i listen (laughs) i listen guys i use my ears and i listen i pay attention you should try it sometime to be fair harry was a little bit preoccupied at that time just a smidge ron has no excuse no ron rarely does (laughs) but harry i mean yeah he had some mental shit going on still does but it's fair yeah really does he's got a double whammy going on this Mm -hmm. book he is a freudian nightmare is what he is yes (laughs) but anyway hermione is talking about how dumbledore says that they need to basically support each other Mm -hmm. they need to band together so that they can be strong against what they have coming united we stand divided we fall all that good shit exactly yeah and she points out that this is basically exactly what the sorting hat was warning them against, too, which makes Ron quote Harry from the night before. So he listens sometimes. Sometimes. Selective. If you think that that means we're going to get matey with the Slytherins, you got another thing coming. I'm not going to lie. I kind of sound like you said mating with the Slytherins. <laughs> if you think that we're going to start mating with Slytherins. <laughs> that makes it a whole new sentence. And a whole new book. Yeah. Mm. Hogwarts hmm. After Dark right (laughs) awkward but back to this book yes hermione just points out that it's kind of a pity they aren't even just trying for some inner house unity Mm -hmm. and they're still making their way down to the great hall at this point so it's just perfect timing that she makes that comment and this group of fourth year students see harry and just panic and huddle together like he's going to attack the stragglers or something which just makes harry say yeah i can really see how we should be friends with that (laughs) Mm-hmm. I mean, he's not really helping himself there, though. It's like what Nearly Headless Nick said. Not with that attitude. Exactly. It's not going to help you. They're yeah. scared of you right now because they don't have any idea what's going on. And the little bit of information that they have gotten is being contradicted and extremes yeah. from the Daily Prophets. Not to mention the fact that he's blowing up at every single person who looks at him wrong. Well, to be fair, he's not. Well, he's mostly ignoring it all at this point. He kind of blew up at Seamus a little bit, but even that was more of a sarcastic, why don't you just read the Daily Prophet like your mom? He's been keeping it together in the book. True. However, I like to think that that boy's got some resting bitch face going on. Oh, I would think so. Sometimes that can frighten anyone. Sometimes that's worse than losing it on everybody. Yeah, because sometimes your imagination oh, yeah. can do way more damage than a real experience. Oh, yeah, definitely. They're probably just imagining him losing his shit and turning on them, probably pulling out a wand, cursing them. Right. Who knows what they think this madman is going to do? Exactly. This attention-seeking nutter. Ticking time bomb. That's probably how he's completely coming off. Yeah. Because... All they know is what they've heard from their parents or the other students or the Daily Prophet or this. And then he comes up and he's very put offish. I guess that's not even a word. It's Harry RBF. Yeah. I mean, he's probably not looking like the most comforting presence. (laughs) HRBF. Definitely. So you kind of can't blame them. You kind of can, though. I mean, depending on. Yeah. No fine fuck it we'll blame them fuck them (laughs) but anyway but they make their way into the great hall and again the ceiling that is enchanted to look like the sky is just super dark and cloudy Mm -hmm. kind of drizzly looking and harry's just thinking it matches his mood because he just feels like a little rain cloud poor little eeyore (laughs) (laughs) it's just that's another middle name (laughs) harry meddling patronus 
Niffler. Niffler Marie Eeyore Potter. <laughs> For James, his actual middle name. For, well, <laughs> <laughs> we're never going to keep all of these straight. You no. should write it down. I just like coming up with new ones all the time. Yeah. But again, again, because they cannot let this go, Harry has to bring up the fact that Hagrid is missing. To be fair, he's never been missing before. Well, I'm just pointing out that the movie barely shared any of that. Oh, yeah. The movie didn't give a shit. (laughs) And Harry's still looking around. Hagrid is still not there. He comments about how Dumbledore never even mentioned how long Grubbly Blank would be staying or anything. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is what makes Hermione say that she thinks maybe Dumbledore didn't want to draw attention to Hagrid's absence. Well, of course not. But Harry's sitting there like, how can you not draw attention to it? The fact that he's not here is the most conspicuous thing. It's this giant Hagrid-shaped object that's just lacking. Pretty literally, too. Yes. Yeah. Very literally. Mm-hmm. He's got a Hagrid-shaped hole in his heart. Yeah. Aww. Aww. But before they can really discuss this anymore, they're interrupted by Angelina Johnson, who shows up to tell Harry that she has been made Gryffindor Quidditch captain. Which was our trivia question. Yep. She lets them know that since Wood's gone, they have to replace their keeper. And they're going to have tryouts on Friday at 5, and she wants the whole team to be there so they can see how the newbie fits in with them as a whole. Mm -hmm. Harry's just like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And when she leaves, Hermione starts wondering how much of a difference Wood being gone is going to make on the team. Because he was the captain and he was a really good keeper. Spanking good, I believe, the Weasley twins put it. We wouldn't mind spanking Wood, now would we? Mm. I would spank all of her Wood. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But then Ron makes a comment about how it couldn't hurt to have some new blood. Hint, hint. Mm, nudge, right. nudge. Wink, wink. <laughs> hey, do you know I got a new broom? I got a new broom. Hey. Hey, hey, Harry. I got a new broom. The Quidditch team needs some new blood. I, I can play keeper. Can I play keeper? I'm going to come to tryouts. I'm not telling you any of this. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> but we'll get to that. Not in the movie, we won't. True story. There's just so much left out of the movie. Mm. Boo. Like all of this first half of the chapter. Yeah. And Quidditch in general. And so. Quidditch in general. So there's that. But really, I mean, Oliver's gone. What's the point? This is the one movie that does not show any Quidditch at all. Although I would argue that Goblet of Fire didn't either because they never actually showed a Quidditch match. They had people on brooms mm-hmm. pre-Quidditch match. Yeah. That was one of my trivia questions for my audition for the quiz show. Mm-hmm. They wanted to know which movie didn't show any Quidditch matches. Yeah. And I was like, oh, totally Goblet of Fire, because that's what we were on. Yeah. And she said, no. And I was like, okay, well, then it's Order of the Phoenix. But technically. But technically. Yeah. She's like, well, they had the Quidditch World Cup. And I was like, did they, though? <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, they didn't pick me to be on the show. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. I'm argumentative. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I could just see you now, just throwing down with Helen Mirren. (laughs) (laughs) It's not how it happened in the books, Helen. It's not how it happened in the books. But anyway, I digress. This is just like the chapter of interruptions, because now their conversation is interrupted by the arrival of all of the owls and their deliveries. Mm -hmm. Amazon Prime showing up. Yeah, like it does. And A large barn owl actually comes right towards Hermione and delivers a copy of the Daily Prophet, which just pisses Harry off because he wants to know why she's still getting that garbage. Friends close, enemies closer. Exactly what Hermione's thinking. Mm -hmm. She says that it's important to know what their enemies are saying about them. Yeah. But she proceeds to read the entire magazine. I'm sure she's just skimming it, but you know that girl can speed read. Right. Oh, definitely. She reads the whole thing and then rolls it up at the end of breakfast and says, there's actually nothing about you or Dumbledore in here. So, yay. Score. <laughs> Must have been a slow week for him. Mm-hmm. The next interruption is Professor McGonagall handing out all of their schedules, which absolutely horrifies Ron because he takes one look at their Monday schedule and sees that first they have Snooze Fest History of Magic. Mm-hmm. Then they have Double Potions. 
<sighs> Twice the fun with Snape. Mm-hmm. Then they have divination. His favorite. <laughs> Everyone's favorite. And then they have double defense against the dark arts, which might have been fun if Lupin was still teaching. Right. Or even fake Moody. Yeah. Or even real Moody. Well, yeah. Might be better than Pepto Bitch Mall. Mm, definitely. Not that they quite know that yet, but they're going to learn. Mm-hmm. Based on her little speech the night before. It's not looking promising. No. Not at all. And Ron starts talking about how he really hopes that Fred and George figure out their skiving snack boxes soon. <laughs> Which, of course, this is that perfect comedic timing where Fred and George happen to walk up right at that moment and are like, do my ears deceive me? Does a Hogwarts prefect want to skyboth classes? And Ron's just... Look at my schedule. <laughs> this is terrible. Fred just responds, oh, that's fair. You want a deal on some nosebleed nugget? <laughs> we'll sell it to you cheap. Which makes Ron want to know why they're willing to sell it to him cheap. Yeah. Because you know that he knows well enough not to trust them at this point. Right. But they're at least honest and admit that they don't have an antidote to stop the bleeding yet. So if you take one, you're just going to gush until. <laughs> that's a really gross mental image you just gave me you're Thank welcome you. and so ultimately ron decides to pass on this deal probably the right call he has his moments mm -hmm. and hermione decides that this is the opportune moment to lecture them about advertising for testers on the gryffindor notice board that'll go over nicely Honestly, I think they handle it pretty well because whereas they do kind of argue her point, they're being very playful about it and they're just telling her that she's going to change her tune, especially when this year really gets going and the teachers start piling on the homework because it's their OWL year and their fifth year and it's going to suck. Mm -hmm. And they talk about how about half of their year in fifth year had mental breakdowns and all of this other stuff that happened. They just really think that Hermione is going to get to a point where she's so overwhelmed, she might want to occasionally skip a class too. Which I honestly don't think they really believe that. And that's why I say it's a playful joke. Do you expect anything less from Fred and George? Not even remotely. Nope. Not at all. And that's why we love them. But George does specifically refer to it as a nightmare of a year, especially if you care about exam results, which we all know Hermione does. Of course. But he says that he and Fred still manage to keep their spirits up, which makes Ron point out that they only got about three OWLs each. Hey, better than none. It is better than none. And they're not the slightest bit concerned. They were actually ready to just completely blow off their seventh year. They don't care about their any WTs. No. They've got money from Harry now, and they start to say that, and Harry basically kicks them under the table. Yeah. He, like, shoots them a look. <laughs> don't X -day. say anything. x -day on the anime. <laughs> Fucking shut up, guys. Stop it. Seriously. Stop it. <laughs> but George fixes it, and he says, now that we have our OWLs, mm -hmm. we don't really care about any WTs, though we did ultimately decide we weren't going to leave school early because we weren't sure mom could handle it, especially on top of Percy being such a prat. You know, that was probably a really considerate thing, right? actually, of them. And I don't think that the twins aren't considerate. No. I think that they're just jokesters and they like to have a lot of fun. And sometimes that fun could be perceived as inconsiderate. Mm -hmm. But I think if they're fully thinking about it ahead of time, they are considerate. Right. When it comes down to it. Mm -hmm. They love the twins. Yeah. When push comes to shove, they can be very considerate. Right. And there's actually a moment later on in the book that specifically shows this and an entirely different added moment in the movie that also shows it. Yes. So and we'll talk a little bit more about the twins' consideration later on. Yeah. It's a really nice moment, I have to say. Yeah. But they say that they're going to make the most of their final year at Hogwarts and do some market research so they can really target what they need to for their joke shop. And Hermione is just sitting there wondering where they're going to get all the gold they need to start this up. So Harry deliberately knocks his fork over so he has to dive under the table to pick it up so they can't see him turning bright red. Mm -hmm. like he is just well aware that every look on his face is going to give away that he knows something they don't know. Oh, yeah. He's got zero chill. 
and he just has to duck out of sight so that he can get past this moment. Yeah. And when he's under the table, he hears Fred say, ask us no questions and we'll tell you no lies, Hermione. And then they decide to leave early so they can get to class and try and sell some extendable ears before it starts. Mm -hmm. Leaving Hermione to sit there and wonder if they already have gold and where they would have gotten it. Which Ron backs up by pointing out that they bought him dress robes over the summer. Mm -hmm. And he has no idea how they were able to afford that. So Harry comes out from under the table and just says, do you think that fifth year is really hard like they said? (laughs) I'm not obviously changing the subject, guys. (laughs) That's like a really nervous way of saying, mind your business. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. (laughs) But this works. And Ron says that he's sure it will be tough because OWLs can affect what jobs you get later after you leave Hogwarts. And Bill said that another part of fifth year was getting career advice. So shit's becoming real during fifth year. But they start to make their way to their first class, History of Magic, and they're discussing what they want to do when they leave Hogwarts, which both Ron and Harry are like, we're going to be Aurors. Mm Mm-hmm. And when they ask Hermione, she says she's not sure. She just knows she wants to do something worthwhile, which makes Ron say being an R is worthwhile. Yeah, but maybe she wants to live and not have to, like, worry for her life every single day. It's possible. She also mentions possibly taking SPEW further. Which would negate the whole living another day thing, I think. (laughs) And Ron and Harry just can't even make eye contact at this point. (laughs) They're afraid they're going to start laughing or say something they shouldn't. So they just resolutely look away from one another. Just whistling like... (laughs) But anyway, they get to History of Magic, which is pretty much known as the most boring of all subjects. And honestly, I think that's just a connotation that history in general can sometimes get true but it really all depends on how it's taught to you exactly when you have a ghost teacher you're not in for like a good time you think that you could be but he just drones on and on and he has this wheezy voice that is said to cause severe drowsiness within 10 minutes five if it's warm outside that tracks yeah I like to think that if they would have kept Bins in the movie, he would have been played by Ben Stein. Bueller. Potter. 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 Ranger. I know he calls them all by the wrong name. Grant. (laughs) Grant. There we go. (laughs) Yeah, that would have been proper casting, I think. Hell yeah. But no, they did not include him in the movie. So all we get is just this mention of him in the book. Yeah. The occasional mention of him in the book. And as we already know from the ceiling in the Great Hall, it's not really that warm today. Mm -mm. It's kind of overcast and drizzly and just generally blah. So Harry and Ron do make it 10 minutes into this lecture, which is about giant wars and could have actually been interesting had anybody else been teaching it. Right? Like that could actually be a really cool subject if you're taught by an engaging teacher. Yes. If you're taught by anyone but Bins. Yes. I would almost say. I feel like something like that could even make Umbridge interesting. To be fair, Umbridge is not not interesting, but that is also part of her problem. True. Because the thing that makes her interesting is horrifying as well. That is true. But we're getting there. Yes. So anyway, after 10 minutes, Harry and Ron just completely give up trying to pay attention and just start playing hangman on their note-taking parchment instead. Like you do. Which just pisses Hermione off because the only reason why Harry and Ron ever pass this class is simply because they copy her notes before exams. So she's tired of doing all of the work for them, basically. Understandably. And she just keeps giving them dirty looks until the end of class. And then as they're leaving, she says, how would it be if I just didn't give you my notes this year? And Ron says, well, then we'd fail our OWLs. How would you feel about having that on your head? (laughs) Which is such a dick move. Ron can definitely be a little bit of a dick. It's such a dick move because you know that means a lot to Hermione. Yeah. She just tells them that they deserve it, though. Yeah. For not paying attention, they deserve it. And asks if they even bother paying attention. Mm Mm-hmm. She says, do you even try to listen to him? So Ron responds by saying, of course we try. We're just not as clever as you are. (laughs) We don't have your brains or your concentration. Way to rub it in, Hermione. (laughs) 
<laughs> Compliments will get you nowhere, Weasley. It kind of works. She calls yeah. that rubbish. Like, she's well aware mm. that he's just flattering her, but at the same time, she kind of likes it, too. Mm, oh, yeah. I like to think a little bit of a blush comes up. <laughs> he like... thinks I'm clever. <laughs> so it slightly mollifies her. Yeah. And they have a little bit of a break now between classes. So they just make their way out into the courtyard and it is kind of drizzling. So they just huddle together under a secluded corner where they can get a little bit of respite from the rain. Mm -hmm. And they talk about what difficult potion Snape is going to set them to making because that's their next class. They're positive it's going to be difficult. He has yet to give them a not difficult potion. So yeah, it's definitely a reasonable assumption. But as I mentioned, this is the episode of Interruptions. Mm -hmm. So they are again interrupted. This time it's by Cho Chang, who has again, two days in a row now, come to say hi to Harry. She has gone out of her way mm -hmm. to come say hi to Harry. You know what? For a 16-year-old, that's flirting. Oh, he's sitting there like, Cho Chang! <laughs> he's also very relieved that this time he's not covered in stink sap. I would be too. And she is clearly thinking along those same lines because her opening line to him is, oh, you got all that stuff off you then. Yeah. <laughs> and poor Harry tries to grin about it like he thinks it was a funny moment, not this mortifying one. Mm hmm. Which, you know, in 25 years, I'm sure he will look back on it as though it was funny. But right now, too soon. Too soon. Too Definitely. Soon, this is a day later. <laughs> But he awkwardly asks her how her summer was. It's so lame. Not even just it lame. He immediately regrets asking that because this was Cedric Diggory's girlfriend. So she's had the summer of my boyfriend died. I mean, but he's had the summer of I watched her boyfriend die. So they both kind of... It kinda, sucked. Yeah. They can commiserate, I feel. I think that is her goal. Mm-hmm. Whereas Harry is just trying to move on from it. Yeah. And he hasn't quite picked up on that yet. He's just excited that Cho Chang is coming to talk to him. Yep. He's got an in now. Yeah. Or so he thinks. Yeah. He kind of does. Not in the way he hopes, though. No. We just don't know It does not work yet. out that way. No. We'll get there. And her face just kind of falls a little bit, but she says it was all right. I'm sure she made the most of it. Mm-hmm. And at this point... Ron just jumps in the conversation to ask her about the tornadoes badge that she's wearing, wanting to know if she supports them. And if you remember in the article mentioned in the Quibbler, mm -hmm. one of the things mentioned on the cover was how the tornadoes are taking over the Quidditch League. Yeah. So they've had this big just burst of winds. Mm -hmm. And along with that has been many people jumping on the tornado's bandwagon. One could say it's been a whirlwind. A of... whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> of attention. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Ron wants to know if she's always supported them or if it's just since they've been winning. And Cho very coldly tells him that she's been supporting them since she was six. Yeah, bitch. Yeah, bitch. And then she says bye to Harry and just walks away. Which makes Hermione just smack Ron. You're so insensitive. Why would you attack her about her Quidditch team when she clearly just wanted to talk to Harry alone? Mm-hmm. And Ron's like, I wasn't stopping her from talking to him. You are such a cock block, Ron. <laughs> Ron is totally a cock block. <laughs> and so oblivious about it, too. He has absolutely no idea what he just did. Oh, no. He has zero clue. It's kind of adorable in a weird way, but... It's also really annoying. Right? It's got to be <laughs> frustrating as fuck. And this, again, prompts an argument between Ron and Hermione, because we're starting to see this theme happen here. Mm-hmm. Which is also really starting to be annoying to Harry. Well, yeah. And they don't even notice the bell ring, and Harry just has to say, Hey, bell ring, we need to get to potions. We gotta go, guys. So they get up and start moving, but they just keep on arguing their whole way to class, which is kind of nice for Harry because he can just tune them out and think about everything that has just happened. Like, Cho came to see me two days in a row. Cho Chang, does she <laughs> like me? I think she might like me. Awkward boner. <laughs> Good thing he's going to potions to have that cauldron yeah. to stand in front of. He also finds himself wondering if he's ever going to get to have a conversation with her that doesn't end in him wanting to leave the country. 
between Neville and Ron, he's not having good luck with that. Kid, you're 15. I mean, answer to that is definite no. no. <laughs> Very resounding no. But he definitely just feels this little happy bubble building up in his Aww. chest because this is two days in a row that she has gone out of her way to talk to him. Aw, he's lactating butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> And even entering Snape's dungeon does not burst this bubble. That's impressive. Right? Mm -hmm. He's pretty happy. At least for now. That changes pretty quickly in double potions class. Well, it's Snape. He has that talent. Everybody has to have a talent. Mm -hmm. This is definitely one of his biggest strengths. Mm -hmm. It's like master potion brewer. Asshole. <laughs> and I will give him potion brewer above that. Yeah. Master potions master. I'm going with it. And then massive buzzkill. Oh, yeah. Just completely. And you know what? I struggle to think what he gets more enjoyment out of. It probably just depends on his mood. True. And who it is that he's killing the buzz of. Yeah. But in true form of beginning the buzzkill, he enters his classroom, closes the door, and this automatically silences everybody. Mm -hmm. Which would be an amazing power to have, but I wouldn't want to be such a dick to get that power. Yeah, that makes sense. He still makes it a point to tell the class to settle down, which is super entertaining to me just because they're already quite settled. I mean, they're horrified of you, sir. It's probably just habit. I'm sure he has some classes that will push it. Yeah. But then he begins class in what is about to become pretty much the trend for this first week of school. By mentioning the fact that they have important exams in June. Mm -hmm. And he tells them that though moronic some of the class may be, he expects them to at least get an acceptable on their exams or they're going to suffer his displeasure. In true dungeon master form. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and as he says this, he focuses on Neville, who just gulps. In true Snape form. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Snape continues speaking, telling them that this is basically the last year some of them are going to be studying with him because he will only take the very best into his NEWT potions class. Mm -hmm. So some of them, moronic that they are, are going to be <laughs> saying goodbye. And this time he focuses on Harry, who just glares right back at him, secretly thinking, fuck you, I don't care if I don't take potions next right. year. <laughs> It's fine with me. I'd love to not take potions next year. Right. I am begging you to not accept me. Like, I'm just begging for it right please, now. Please, please, please. But then Snape continues his first day speech mm -hmm. and says that they have another year before that moment of farewell. So he advises them to concentrate on maintaining the high pass level that he expects, whether they plan to continue potions or not. In other words, even if I'm not going to be your teacher next year... You will still suffer my displeasure if you fuck this shit up, kids. Mm-hmm. Oh, he can make your life a living hell whether you're in his class or not. Oh, yeah. We all know that. Definitely. And he will go out of his way to find those students, Harry, <laughs> and make sure that their <laughs> life is a living hell. Exactly. But for today's class, they're going to be making a potion that's very likely to show up on the exam. Mm -hmm. It's known as the Draft of Peace, and it calms anxiety and soothes agitation, which I would like to know how to brew that myself. Right? I could use about a gallon of that. Yeah, just daily. Yeah. <laughs> Though being too heavy-handed with the ingredients can put the drinker into a heavy and sometimes irreversible sleep. I still don't see an issue. Right? It's the irreversible part. Yeah, I guess. Like, you're just in a really peaceful coma. I'm not seeing a downside yet. You're never going to ever wake up again and see your kid or your husband. But I'm peaceful. <laughs> so maybe I'm seeing them in my dreams. Maybe. I don't know how that is. Sure, Katie. <laughs> we'll be heavy-handed with your ingredients. <laughs> Score. But anyway, he lets them know this because insists that they must pay close attention, which then makes Hermione sit up straighter because she always has to pay close attention and prove that she's the best student. And Snape does his usual flick his wand, the directions and ingredients show up on the board. Mm -hmm. There's a post that floats around where somebody is commenting about how Snape 
knows all of these correct ways. Like he made all of those notations in his own book, but then taught out of the book. And yeah. everybody that knows is like, uh, no, he didn't. He put the directions on the board. Like he always gave them the correct directions, the better directions. Yeah. And I have to wonder how Hermione never noticed that because they had a book. Yeah. Did she ever compare the two? Not in the movie because they didn't do the on the board thing. I mean, they barely had potions class. That is true. But I just always kind of wondered about that. Yeah. But anyway, he tells them that the ingredients are in the store cupboard and they have an hour and a half because this is double potions. Mm -hmm. And it is exactly how the trio predicted. This potion sucks balls. Yeah. It is so very, very specific. You have to add the ingredients in a specific order. You have to do it at the right time. You have to stir in the proper directions and switch directions for the exact number of times. The temperature has to be exact. It has to simmer for a certain amount of time all before you add the last ingredients. And it just sounds really stressful to me. Yeah. Because you know me. I don't follow directions well. You really don't. (laughs) You really, really don't. I sort of throw things together and hope that it works out. I enjoy following directions. Like, I enjoy having really specific directions. But I'm not always that good at, like, remembering certain things. Like, if it says stir counterclockwise for 12 turns or whatever, I'm going to lose count. Yes, absolutely. I am for certain going to lose count. However, if it's something I can time, I'm on it. Right. You know? Set a timer. Yeah, I actually have a tendency to do exactly what Harry did Mm -hmm. because they start working on this potion. And when they have about 10 minutes left to class, Snape tells them that a light silver vapor should be rising from the potion at this point. Mm -hmm. And Harry's is just issuing this copious amounts of dark gray steam, which is definitely not silver. Mm -hmm. And he looks up from that mess and sees that Ron's is actually putting off green sparks and (laughs) Seamus's fire has gone out, which definitely couldn't be helping something. No. And it's weird because Seamus is really good at fire. Right? (laughs) Movie Seamus anyway. Well, yes. (laughs) Hermione's is actually perfect. So shocker there. Mm -hmm. But Snape just goes right past it. Doesn't make a comment at all because he couldn't find anything to criticize. Exactly. And just goes straight to Harry. Even though Ron's is giving off sparks. Mm -hmm. He targets Harry because it's Snape and it's Harry. And he starts to give him a hard time asking him to read the third line. So Harry reads all the directions out and realizes that he forgot to add the Hellbore syrup. Mm -hmm. Two drops of it. Last thing on the line. And he just skips straight to line four. Totally missed that step. It obviously fucked everything else up. Yep. And Snape's like, did you do everything on line three? Which I think is, I mean, this is a total dick move, but it is impressive as fuck. That he knew exactly. That he could tell Mm -hmm. by looking at Harry's potion in the color of the smoke rising off of it, what step he missed. Yeah. Say what you want about him, but he was an impressive ass potions master. And that is why I put it above Buzzkill. Yeah. Rightfully so. And then here comes the Buzzkill. Mm -hmm. Because after impressively identifying the issue with Harry's potion and getting him to admit he forgot to add the Hellbore, he then uses Evanesco to vanish his entire potion, Mm -hmm. telling him that it's useless, and then proceeds to tell the rest of the class to put a sample of their potion in a flagon and label it with their name to turn in to be tested. But Harry can't do that because his was just vanished. So Harry is now going to get zero marks, even though there were plenty of people in that class that had potions worse than him. Yeah. And that is just a dick, buzzkilly move. Mm-hmm. You're right. It's also eh, a Snape move. Yeah. Basically. Well, <laughs> I could have said that in less words. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then as everyone is filling up their samples, Harry's just cleaning up his shit. So the moment the bell rings, he's out the door. He makes it all the way to the Great Hall and starts eating his lunch before Ron and Hermione even catch up with him. Mm-hmm. Which they know he's upset. So the first thing they try to do is comfort him and tell him that it was completely unfair of Snape. And yeah. Harry's like, well, when has Snape ever been fair to me? It's a fair point. Yeah, they have nothing to counter it either. They're yeah. just like, uh... Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, there was that time that he saved you from the fucked up broom that Coral was doing. Uh, but, but, I mean, 
Yeah, I got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and Hermione just says that she was hoping that he'd be better this year since they're all in the order now. Not that the kids are in the order, but no, close knit but... quarters over the summer. Like maybe just maybe there'll be a little bit of camaraderie here. No, not so much. Not even a little bit. If anything, it feels a little bit worse because it's Snape like making up for the fact that they know his secret. Yeah. And they know what's going on. But it's almost like him going, now I'm going to be even worse because I can't have anybody suspecting shit. That we're actually on the same side. Yeah, exactly. Can't let people think I might like you. Can't let people think I'm a decent human being. Heaven forbid I don't do shit like that. Right. Yet another Snape move. Mm hmm. Anyway, so she's hoping that he'd be better this year, which he's not. And Ron very <laughs> sagely points out that poisonous toadstools don't change their spots. He also mentions that he's always kind of thought Dumbledore is cracked for even trusting Snape to begin with and wants to know what evidence there is that Snape is even on the good side. Mm -hmm. Which makes Hermione insist that Dumbledore's got to have some evidence. And then the two start bickering again. And Harry's just like, will you shut up? Mm -hmm. and he just gets up yeah he tells them that they're fighting all the time and it's driving him mad and he just walks out yeah and he ends up spending the rest of his lunch hour just sitting by himself underneath the trap door at the north tower mm -hmm. before going to divination since that's where he goes next might as well i mean save yourself some frustration yeah you know and then when the bell rings and the ladder descends he climbs it's the first one in the classroom and trelawney's just so busy with all the books that she doesn't even notice him arrive which he's actually probably relieved about because he also hates this class well yeah predominantly because she keeps predicting his death mm -hmm. and eventually everybody else starts showing up to class and when ron does he makes his way right to harry and informs him that he and hermione have stopped bickering mm -hmm. but that hermione says it'd be really nice if he'd stop taking out his temper on them that's fair it's totally fair yeah but I think Harry also has every right to be annoyed with their bickering. He's got a lot to be upset about. Now, is that what he was actually mad about? Probably not. He's probably annoyed by it, definitely. For sure. But maybe not mad. But she and Ron both say that it is not their fault how Snape and Seamus are treating Harry. Which is true. And again, we're on your side. Yeah, very Stop fair point. Stop attacking us. And Harry wants to say, well, stop bickering with each other. It's really annoying. But again, interrupted mm -hmm. by Trelawney starting class. Heaven forbid. <laughs> Can we just call this book Harry Potter and the Interrupting Cow? <laughs> <laughs> this chapter for sure. Yeah. Even the whole thing, even the next half and next week. <laughs> but Trelawney welcomes them back, makes the whole like airy fairy comment about how she was monitoring their progress over the summer and was relieved to see they all made it back safely as she knew they would mm -hmm. and then tells them that they'll find copies of the dream oracle by Inigo Imago hello my name is Inigo, Inigo Imago, Imago. <laughs> you read my dream prepare to cry <laughs> But she tells them that dream interpretation is an important means of divining the future and likely to be on their OWL examination in June. Because like I said, it is a theme of this week. Right. All of the teachers are just first day exams in June. Mm hmm. This year's no joke. Yep. She also then goes on to say that she doesn't really believe in exams. <laughs> She thinks that examination passes or failures aren't remotely important when it comes to the sacred art of divination. Because you either got it or you don't. Yeah. It reminds me of like most art teachers. I know you're an art teacher. But it's basically like it's so open to interpretation. I hate giving grades in art. Yeah. I hate it so much. I literally make them up. Yeah. I have a rubric that I can pretend to follow. I just have it all set up where it's out of 15 points. Mm -hmm. so there's five different categories they can get a maximum of three points in each category but when i'm actually grading the artwork i think about the kid i look at their work and i say yeah that's about a 13 <laughs> <laughs> and then if i actually have to fill out the rubric i just fill it out accordingly to the end yeah, it's about a 14 sure <laughs> i like you you can have 15 out of 15 <laughs> again all subjective mm -hmm. and that's kind of how Trelawney's taking this. Too. Here's hoping that my boss doesn't listen to this for multiple reasons. I was trying not to say that. <laughs> I'm a knock on wood for you. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, back to divination. You see what I did there? I see this. You said a thing and then you said another thing and then you brought it back to the first thing. Yes. Well done. She directs them to open to the introduction Mm -hmm. to read what Inigo Imago has to say. I love that name. (laughs) It is a great name. It's way better than Doris Perkis. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Inigo Imago. Mm -hmm. But they have to read the introduction and then partner up with someone to discuss and interpret each other's dreams, which I kind of think that sounds like fun. Yeah. Unless you're Harry and you have really weird fucking dreams. Creepy ones at that. Right? Voldemort in a suit? Who wants to interpret that? No one. Well, that was movie only, so. True. I still don't want to interpret it, though. Well, and they didn't do anything like this in the movie, so he wouldn't have gotten to. True. The only positive thing to Harry at this point is they're not in a double lesson. Mm -hmm. So by the time they all finish reading this introduction, they only have about 10 minutes to do the dream interpretation part. And of course, Harry and Ron are partnered together. And they can hear Neville telling Dean this really long-winded explanation about his nightmare that involved a giant pair of scissors wearing his grandmother's best hat. (laughs) Which I don't even know how to get started with what that could possibly mean. There is so much to unpack there. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And what's really interesting is I wouldn't necessarily think of dream interpretation as a way of divining the future. But I definitely think dream interpretation can have a lot of psychology behind it. Oh, yeah. The way your mind works and the way that it makes you perceive different things. Right. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. Ron looks at Harry and tells him that he never remembers his dream, so he wants Harry to share one. Maybe you don't, though. And Harry's just sitting there thinking, I don't need to tell anybody about my dreams of the graveyard. Clearly, I already know what they mean, too. Yeah. Like, there's nothing to interpret here. My life's fucked up, and I have (laughs) nightmares about it. We don't need to go over this, Ron. You gotta remember something. My head is a garbage dump of psychology issues yeah all right like we know this i'm good let's move on yeah (laughs) so ron mentions having one about playing quidditch which another hint there another hint there Mm -hmm. nudge nudge Nudge, wink wink wink. but harry thinks that it probably means he's going to be eaten by a giant marshmallow or something sure i love the sarcasm (laughs) it's so random it's delightful and he actually does flip through the book to pretend to find an interpretation for this dream which Mm -hmm. any idiot can tell you that it means ron wants to join the fucking quidditch team right (laughs) and how harry i know he has a lot going on but how he hasn't picked up on this it's harry not a ravenclaw no he is definitely not observant he does not have the eye that's for damn no, sure. He does not. <laughs> he doesn't even have the outer eye. His like inner forget eye the inner eye. glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but he flips through the book with zero interest. Mm-hmm. And then isn't even remotely cheered, I can't imagine why, when Trelawney tells him that they have to keep a dream diary for the next month as homework. Yeah, but that's such an opportunity to be creative. Because they're just going to make shit up anyway. Which I think they do. Yeah. I think that's exactly what they do. That's what they've been doing the whole time they've had divination, for fuck's sake. Why stop now? Right. It's their norm. It's the go-to. Yeah. But anyway, this is where we're going to cut the book chapter off. Mm -hmm. So that next week is a reasonable length. Yeah. And corresponds with the movie section as none of this was there. Right. And since we didn't have any movie scenes, we have obviously no actors to talk about. Nope. So there's that. And we're just going to move on to our Potter pondering. Which is, do you think Hermione ever noticed that the directions Snape wrote on the board were not the exact same as they were in the potions book? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. You can also stitch a response on TikTok. No matter how you do it, we really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. That'll bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Tom Heaven. He writes, My name is Tom Heaven. I am a Ravenclaw. My wand is maple wood with a dragon heartstring core, and my Patronus is a turtle. 
I first learned of Harry Potter in high school when, in my senior year, my homeroom teacher played the audiobook of Sorcerer's Stone. I saw the first two movies and was drawn in. After getting my first paycheck for my first job, I bought the paperback of Chamber of Secrets, and after finishing it, I went to the library and checked out Prisoner of Azkaban and Goblet of Fire, and would come up with fan casting for new characters. I went to Borders at midnight during every release day, even convincing my cousins to join me when Half-Blood Prince's release coincided with a family reunion. I got my dad into the fandom, and we constantly have our jokes about the series. I love that. Yeah. I love when they just bring everyone together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's definitely amazing for that. Mm-hmm, for sure. And thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Tom. Yes, thank you. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, what is the name of chapter one of Defensive Magical Theory? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag page five will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 12, Professor Umbridge and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.